standing up here in past years. Um, she was the CEO uh, for Texas Health Institute, and uh, she's always open the sessions. We're really missing her this year. She's been a part of this event from the very beginning. The Southern BC Summit started with seed capital from the Margaret Wood Johnson Foundation. It was a spin-off project of the Southern Rural Access Program. After the past 11 years, we've gathered together and learned and, and grown, and Camille has led that charge. I've never met anybody more passionate than Camille. Over the summer, she decided, after devoting many, many years to public health, that she was going to have to uh, take some family time. And uh, we're going to miss her, her guidance, and her passion. But we will continue, and we will be inspired. And the, uh, excuse me, and we will continue to fight the good fight. So, can we have a round of applause? Can we? Sorry, I'm one of those people. I, just, <laughs> I don't give people awards because. <laughs> oh, you're so good. <laughs> So, um, we're here today because we have an obesity epidemic, and we have some great people over here. Dr. David Satcher, who 15 years ago declared the obesity epidemic. So, it's, it's continued to cause many issues across the South, especially. Our ability, it's, it's overwhelming the different areas of our lives that it impacts. Our ability to be active where we live, work, and play is critical. Our access to healthy, affordable food is critical. Recognition of obesity as a disease that sometimes needs treatment is critical. A work environment that encourages healthy, excuse me, behaviors is critical. Schools that promote healthy eating and physical activity have to be involved. Early child care environments that encourage our youngest Southerners to make healthier choices Everyone needs these opportunities. There are changes that are taking place in all these areas across the South. I think we've done some really positive things, but they're not taking place with equity. So this year's summit is going to explore many different ideas and initiatives and policies that can prevent obesity. But we must look at these ideas with a different lens. One that takes into account socioeconomic factors, cultural impacts, inequities in food access and physical activity opportunities. We must focus on families and neighborhoods and communities and truly create a culture of health that encourages wellness and makes healthy choices the easy choice. So as you're attending sessions over the next couple of days, do so with a lens that encompasses the opportunities and the barriers that take place in your state. One that considers how these initiatives and policies relate to the different populations in your communities how they impact the people with the most challenging obesity issues. Work to identify key factors that relate to the cultural challenges, whether it's an association of weight with success, as in some, social, some cultures, or the lack of appropriate of opportunities for being active in some neighborhoods. How is what you're learning and experiencing going to help you make a difference when you return to your state or your community or your job or, and, and try to make a difference? In your, in your program, you'll see a roadmap that was included with some guiding questions to think about as you move through the next few days. We want you to be able to return to your home state and be prepared to take action. We want to thank each of you for the role you're playing. I want you to know that when we looked at the registration list, over half of you have a master's or higher level of education. You, over half of you have five plus years of working in obesity prevention. You are the leaders in this field, and we are just really grateful to have you gathered here, sharing your knowledge and sharing what you have learned, and learning from others, maybe to expand into a different area. So, thanks for joining us and helping us make health a priority. I'm going to go through some slides really quickly, just to get the party started. Some of the things that we, we always need to do. We want to thank our uh, partners in crime this year. The Georgia Shape and the Georgia Department of Public Health, they have been fabulous here in Atlanta and in Georgia, helping us put together this agenda. Also want to thank uh, oops, our sponsors, Georgia Shape 
uh, Optum, St. David's Foundation, you will see uh, mostly a lot of these people are also exhibiting, so hopefully you'll get to meet some of them. Our host committee, this is the group that has helped plan the event tomorrow night and worked with us to secure different speakers for different types of sessions in Georgia and from, from Atlanta. We thank them. All these people are in your program, by the way, if you want a closer look. This thing just does not want to work. Uh, and then we have our advisory committee. This, this whole summit is put together with representatives from across the 16 states. And we have people on that advisory committee that work with us on planning the agenda. They review the breakout applications. They'll be helping facilitate the sessions tomorrow in the pillar work groups. So all of these people have been active participants, not just you know names on a, on a piece of paper. And we couldn't do this without them. Our exhibitors, I think a lot of you have already visited some of them, and you have a chance to do that after this session as well. And there was a page in there on social media. Um, We'd love for you to tweet, tweet out. Um, the hashtag is uh, SOSGA2017, and we'd love to have you, you know, hashtag, uh, you know, share your thoughts and experiences over the next few days. And we have a, a screen out there that will be rolling, and we have the different tweets that people put out. So that is it for me. I appreciate your attentiveness. Sorry, I got to blubber a little bit. And I want to invite Chris Parker up. Chris has. Uh, graciously agreed to facilitate for the next few days and help us tie all this together. He is with the Georgia Health Policy Center. Um, he is an associate project director and we are thrilled to have him here. Chris? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to try that one more time. <laughs> uh, we, we want to be as loud as we can on a Sunday afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. I like that energy. My name is Chris Parker. I am um, actually a, the Director of Population and Global Health at the Georgia Health Policy Center. Yeah, I've got a little bit of a promotion since the last time that thing was printed. Um, and I am your uh, energy giver for this afternoon, and your story weaver for the next three days as we think about the work that you have all committed to. I want to start off by just um, welcoming uh, those who are actually visiting the great state of Georgia by a show of hands. Can I just see those folks who are visiting Georgia? Wow, that's what I thought it would be most of you. Welcome, and not only are you visiting, you are here, you did the earlier sessions, and now you're doing this session. You really are the eager beavers. Um, and I am happy that we're going to have a really full discussion and conversation this afternoon about this thing called health equity. We have assembled uh, an amazing panel of folks uh, who will bring um, their thoughts to the conversation. But I'm really hoping that this will be an opportunity for discussion, for interactive engagement. I have been on a little bit of a drive this past year um, to increase the level of civility amongst us as individuals living on the planet together. So just for all my meetings, I ask folks sitting at the tables to turn to the individual or individuals at your table and just, if there's nobody at your table, find somebody and just to affirm them this afternoon say something nice, something like, your hair is amazing, <laughs> or I really like those areas. Please ensure, though, that your comments match. So if, if there's no hair, your hair is amazing, it's probably not affirming. So please take an opportunity, just 30 seconds, find something nice to say about the persons who are sitting beside you, and affirm them this afternoon as we get started. Yeah, I just saw the 
See, it's not that hard. In fact, once you get started, it's sometimes hard to stop. Um, so thank you for doing that. I hope as we go through the next couple of days together, we can just continue to um, affirm each other. We are, as it turns out, all members of the human race. So we just gotta kind of love on each other from time to time. All right, that's the okay next moment. And now we can actually move on into the discussion for the day. I'm not sure if Stephanie Stuckey is in the room. I didn't see her come in. Um, so I am going to move us on. If she comes in a bit later on, we'll probably have greetings from the mayor's office. So this afternoon, we want to have a real good conversation about health equity. The theme of this year's conference, promoting equity, recognizing disparities, and conquering obesity, makes a lot of sense to just most of us inside here. And um, I know we probably come to this discussion with different views of what health equity or maybe health inequity is. And we want to get some of that kind of out on the table and to have that discussion. Um, there are very few people I can think of better to kind of get us started with that discussion than um, a former Surgeon General. And before I introduce him, I just wanted to kind of say to you how I expect things to flow. Uh, Dr. Satchel will have the opportunity to share with us his thoughts on this issue. Um, I'm going to ask you to do some work after he is done and before the panel actually comes to um, make their presentations. I will give you a couple of questions to mull on and then to hear from the panel to have an even more fulminant conversation. So I'm going to ask you to listen as Dr. Satchel pre presents. Um, Note your questions, note what it's doing to you and inside of you, and then we will actually have some opportunity immediately after he's through to have that discourse. Is that clear? Good? So, allow me to introduce this gentleman who really needs no introduction for most of us. Uh, Dr. David Satcher is currently the founding director and senior advisor for the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, prior to that, as you probably well know, um, he was the 16th Surgeon General of the US, the 10th Assistant Secretary of Health for the Department of Health and Human Services, and has also served in a couple of other capacities, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Administration for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease, the Disease Registry. Um, he holds an MD, PhD degrees from Case Western University, and I just believe is one of the most amazing uh, Surgeon Generals that we have ever had. Could you please join me in welcoming him? Welcome to the Dr. David Sancho. reception. Uh, since so many of you are from outside of Atlanta, I should join in welcoming you to Atlanta. Uh, I'm very pleased to be a part of this really outstanding panel and look forward to, to our discussion and to your participation in that discussion. Um, confronting health equity is what I've sort of called this and and I'll start by, by trying to define it. I should tell you that um, as far as the Morehouse School of Medicine is concerned, this topic is quite relevant um, because our mission is leading in the creation and advancement of health equity. Uh, that's the statement of mission for the Morehouse School of Medicine. Now, the, the president at Morehouse, Dr. Valerie uh, Rice, Valerie Montgomery Rice says, health equity is giving people what they need when they need it, in the amount that they need in order to be, to be healthy. So, uh, there are a lot of different definitions of health equity, but I think they all move in that direction. As you know, as most of you probably know, 
in January 2000, um, we released Healthy People 2010. Um, when I was Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health, and that role was really as, as part of my duties as Assistant Secretary for Health. These uh, these plans come after years and years of, of work. Uh, need to set goals. We have only two goals for Healthy People 2010, just two. One was um, the goal of increasing the yields and quality of life, healthy life. Um, we have made some progress in increasing the yields, of course, life expectancy has been increasing in this country, but also, as you probably know, increasingly, uh, people as they get older are suffering. Uh, I can tell you about that, I'm getting older. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, what, what we were concerned about was really improving the quality of life that people are living. Uh, and, and we set that as one of the two goals. The other goal was a commitment to eliminate disparities in health. Um, and that, that goal, of course, has not only been around since the year 2000 and through those 10 years of Healthy People 2010, but it's also incorporated in Healthy People 2020, right? It's a goal of eliminating disparities in health. But somewhere along the way, and I believe starting with the World Health Organization, was, I was involved with the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And we worked for four years, traveling all over the world, trying to really analyze the impact of social determinants of health on health outcomes. And by social determinants, I mean uh, issues related to one's spirit, uh, uh, learning, well, all of those things that impact socially on one's health. So the social determinants of health, um, we uh, released to WHO, and WHO set a goal of health equity in the next generation. So I think health equity uh, has become more and more of a theme globally, not just in the United States. Um, I think um, the when you make a commitment to health equity, um, you're making a commitment to deal with the factors that determine health, and that includes social determinants of health. Now, as you may know. Before the last uh, administration, there was a panel of people headed by the Surgeon General whose responsibility it was to, to really look comprehensively at uh, what would be required for people to really be healthy. And primarily for people to have the opportunity to be healthy. I think opportunity is a very important word when it comes to health equity the opportunity to be healthy. And, you know, I, as Surgeon General, of course, I had this Surgeon General's prescription. And on that prescription, you know, we talked about regular physical activity, at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week. We talked about uh, eating so many servings of fruits and vegetables. These were, these were things that we thought were critical for being healthy, but, you don't have access to safe places to be physically active, or if there's no grocery store in your community, you really don't have the opportunity to be healthy. And so when you talk about health equity, you can start looking at why is it that people don't have health equity. <laughs> then you have to look at those social factors. There are several issues that hopefully we will have time to deal with today when it comes to, to health equity. 
Well, you know, genetic predisposition is important in the sense that, you know, we're not all the same. I don't know if you've seen this uh, slide, which, um, which people are picking apples, and three of them at one uh, tree uh, have the same size, same height boxes that they're standing on. But because they're different heights, they don't have equal opportunity to reach the apples. And at the other tree, of course, the three people have different heights of the boxes because it's whatever they need in order to reach the others. And so the question we're facing, of course, is you know, what, what do people need in order to, to have a healthy weight, a healthy body? What is it that they need? And why is it that they have not been able to achieve it in many cases? I think the last time we looked at data, uh, a very high percentage of people in all groups are obese, adults are obese. And so we've made some progress, but we still have a long ways to go. I think most of our progress has been with children between the ages of two and five. Uh, I was on a panel with Jeff Copeland and uh, Vivek Murthy at the National Academy of Medicine about a year ago, and the report has just come out, so if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. Uh, because we, from our various perspectives, we talked about uh, overweight and obesity, but we spent a lot of time on the issue of the opportunity, you know, to maintain a healthy weight, and therefore the issue of health equity when it comes to overweight and obesity. Uh, in my mind, the three most important social determinants of health would be education, income, and safety. Uh, now, if you turn safety around, you could say violence impedes uh, health. Because if you live in a community and it's not safe to sit on the porch, it's unlikely that you're going to be out walking every morning. So violence, um, violence impedes healthy lifestyles. And so safety is, I think, one of the most important social determinants of health. It is interesting. I remember when I was director of the CDC, and uh, we decided, along with WHO and others that it was really time for us to put together a major effort to eradicate polio. Now as you know, there's only been one disease eradicated and that's uh, smallpox. But we decided it was time to go out to polio. It, it seemed it would then reach. Um, and when we started, of course, the, the four major countries that we targeted were uh, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And we put on a major effort. I remember spending a week in India in which we immunized 100 million children. 100 million. Now, obviously, even though I spent a week there, there were a lot of people who spent much more than that getting ready. That's one thing about being director. I mean, you sort of fly in and fly out. But I mean, seriously, it was a major effort, and it worked. I mean, this post-polio effort resulted in virtually wiping out polio in India. Um, I remember going back to India about 10 years later, and the only people that you saw with polio were adults, no children, because they've been successful. So why is it that we have not been successful in uh, Nigeria, even though we've been partially successful, but in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Any guess? Violence. Violence. Fighting. You can't even get the vaccines to children, in those, especially in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, but I have to say to you, violence in many of our communities are having the same impact on healthy lifestyles. I mean, if people are afraid, 
um, to get up and walk, to, to even sit on the porch, then violence become, becomes a major factor in preventing them from leading a healthy lifestyle. So inequities uh, in opportunities to be healthy uh, prevents one achieving health equity. Among the disparities that we haven't talked enough about, and I know that as part of the Georgia Shape, and I've served on the board of Georgia Shape now for how long, Emily? Maybe two, four years, I'm sorry. But it's, it's been a great group to work with, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because Georgia Shape recognizing, I guess, anything but one thing, the inequities in where we live and work, etc., has focused a lot of attention on schools and education. And I, I believe very strongly that we should expect the schools to provide the kind of environment where children can be physically active on a regular basis. In fact, I believe the schools should require that. And I've written that I think when schools decided to cut out physical ed education, it was a major mistake. Uh, the program Action for Healthy Kids, which we started after leaving government, um, reported in 2004, and I was chairman of the board at that time, reported that um, children who were physically active and who had good nutrition did better in school. They were better behaved, they learned better, and so the, the very thing that many schools had cut out in order to um, in order to spend more time on math and reading, we found out that the kids who were physically active did better on math and reading. So it, it, it was one of those areas where we had made the wrong decision. So, and, so it's just critical to, to be certain about how one thing relates to another. We made those uh, mistakes in some other areas, but I think that's one of the areas. And it's not easy to change, by the way. Uh, once you find out that it was a mistake, it's not easy to go back and change. But let me close by talking specifically about how we deal with inequity in the population. And, and again, this is an area where I think most people in this room uh, are concerned and devoted is how do we, how do we, how do we deal with it? Let me talk about breastfeeding. Uh, I released the Surgeon General's report on breastfeeding, I believe in 2000, and then uh, Surgeon General Benjamin uh, released a follow-up report in 2011. And among other things, of course, uh, breastfeeding had a major impact on the risk of avoiding obesity. It also had an impact on ear infections and, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, lung infections. But the children who were breastfed did better health-wise in all of those areas. When it came to obesity, there was about a 32% difference in terms of the risk of obesity in children who were breastfed as opposed to those who were not. So breastfeeding is something that has to be dealt with. And, and we, we're not all equal in the opportunity to breastfeed. So a lot of people have jobs where they're not necessarily able to breastfeed. And sometimes they, they just don't have the support. I will never forget when I went to uh, the CDC as director, I selected as my deputy, and this was the first time a woman had been a deputy at the CDC, uh, and it was Claire Broom, whom some of you probably know, outstanding scientist, quite involved in the toxic <coughs> shock syndrome. Now, Claire was eight months pregnant when I appointed her as deputy director, uh, but we knew what we were doing, I think. <laughs> One of the first things that Claire did, of course, was to develop a breastfeeding center at the CDC. 
Now, I probably wouldn't have thought of that, right? But, so it doesn't matter. You know, our backgrounds matter, and uh, diversity matters. And so that diversity resulted in this major federal agency, and then I think other federal agencies developing the opportunity for women to breastfeed. And there are major disparities there. I mean, there are women who work in jobs where they don't have the opportunity to store breast milk during the time that they're at work. So again, health equity requires the opportunity to be healthy. Community intervention to improve safety and to educate citizens is something that's beginning to happen, but it, it's a difficult intervention that we have to do together. This whole idea of walkability, our community is walkable. CDC initiated a program, Walk to School, but ran into some big problems because a lot of places don't have sidewalks. So the Walk to School program ran into that barrier almost right away. So it requires a commitment to whatever is needed in order to be healthy, then it's a commitment to make that available so that people can be healthy. And I think that's the that's what we're up against in the whole area of overweight and obesity, but I think in health inequities generally. Well, at the Moa School of Medicine, specifically at the Satchi Health Leadership Institute, um, we have leadership development programs, of course. The first one was um, the Health Policy Fellowship. You're going to hear from Harry Hammond, who uh, developed and ran that program up until a few months ago. He's now up at Georgia State. But um, that program, among other things, required the fellows to spend four months of their tenure in the community, working in the community, because if you're going to help people deal with inequities, you know, they've got to really know what's going on out there in the community. We have two other leadership development programs. We have a, a parent quality parenting program in which we take 100 parents a year and they deal with child development from zero to five. And of course, that of course is given all of the barriers that exist in many of our communities. How do we provide the opportunity for people to be the kind of parents that they want to be and to provide their children with what they, uh, with what they need? NIH has funded uh, us in part to replicate that program in 12 states. I'm sure some of your states. But the idea there is if you're going to resolve inequities, number one, you've got to learn from the community and you've got to share with the community. If you're going to overcome the barriers to equity, you've got to learn and share. So one of our, our mottos is that at Satchel Health Leadership Institute, everybody teaches and everybody learns. We had that in mind when we started the Community Health Leadership Program, the third uh, program to improve the health of the community. And uh, we invited pastors of churches to recommend people from their congregation who would come and spend 12 weeks with us. We would learn from them, they would learn from us how we together could improve the health of the community. And uh, later on, uh, we invited city councilmen and, and uh, count, uh, county commissioners and others to come. So we've now graduated, I'm sure, over 50 city councilman or county commissioner. We, we graduated 10 mayors. And uh, at first it was not clear whether mayors were going to be able to spend 12 weeks on this program, but those 10 did so we just got funded to expand the program specifically for mayors. Because mayors are on the front line when it comes to the health of the community. And that includes violence and all those things that we've talked about as barriers uh, to health equity. So if we're going to take on health equity, we've got to develop a new kind of relationship with community where we understand much better than before uh, how to attack the health inequities. And hopefully the people who spend the time with 
handcuffs will be able to go back and and on with what they have learned from those of us who are in public health um, to be able to do a better job. Uh, my favorite definition of public health is that public health is the collective efforts of a society to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. The conditions, remember, social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, in which they grow and develop, etc. And so public health is our commitment to work together collectively to try to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. It's a challenge that we face, but it's also uh, the opportunity we face. Another one of our sort of mottos has been, in order to achieve health equity, we need leaders who first care enough. We also need leaders who know enough. We need uh, leaders who have the courage to do enough. And we need leaders who will persevere until the job is done. Uh, that's what it's going to take to achieve health equity. But I'm convinced that with the right commitment to working together, we can, in fact, achieve health equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Satcher. Thanks for getting us started. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity now to, maybe if you haven't already done so, and to scribble down any questions of clarification that you might have. You might have heard something or some things from Dr. Satcher that you love the opportunity to kind of question. Um, he mentioned that in his kind of viewpoint, he sees education, income, and safety as the kind of three elements of the determinants of health that really are big and need to be tackled. Um, maybe you'd add another or probably would have some conversation about that. So I'm going to ask you to do this work at your tables. And if you are at a table where there's just one or two individuals, I suggest really strongly that you consider just kind of linking your, your talent and your forces together. So here are the three questions I'm asking you. The first is, what questions of clarification do you have? That's pretty easy. Two, you do this work around Southern obesity. As you think about what's happening in your neck of the world, what are the barriers to health equity? And the third question is, we'll kind of flip of that, what ideas do you have about how to start moving the needle of health equity here in the South. What questions of clarification? What are the principal barriers? And what ideas do you have about moving the needle? Are we clear? Once we've done that, I'll facilitate a little bit of a conversation through all the tables. There are two microphones, and I'll have colleagues in the room who will actually get microphones to the tables. But I'm going to ask you to pick someone at your table to facilitate this discussion. Um, I would start with a person who lives closest to Georgia. So at your table,